Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Afghanistan from the ground up. NBC's Richard Angle is embedded with U.S. troops. The embeds, the PR push. Is America going to abandon the women of Afghanistan? The leaks and the spin. Thailand shuts down WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks fights back. And the Muslims making sense of the nonsensical. Did you hear what they're up to now? In our web video of the week. The recently appointed commander of U.S. and coalition forces in Afghanistan, General David Petraeus, has a difficult task on his hands. The military mission is tough enough, but he's also got to sell a war to an American public, more than 60 percent of which now wants its forces brought home. Like any military man, Petraeus has been using every weapon at his disposal. That includes the media. In part two of our program, we'll examine embedded journalism and the reporters who often provide one-sided coverage of two-sided or multifaceted conflicts like Afghanistan. But first, we're going to look at a weekly U.S. news magazine, Time, and a recent cover story that featured an image of a mutilated woman with the headline, What Happens If We Leave Afghanistan? The story sparked off a debate on journalistic ethics. That's our starting point this week. The image, the article, the editor behind it, and the role of the media in the debate over the war. Today on Face the Nation, one war winds down as we build up for another. Is America going to abandon the women of Afghanistan, the people of Afghanistan again? I think that the Time Magazine cover, it was a shocking cover. It was an emotional cover. This young woman that we put on the cover is a representative of all the women in Afghanistan. I think they have a very cartoonish understanding of the issues in this conflict in Afghanistan. It reduces it to, do you want to help Bibi Aisha or not? Do you want to abandon the women of Afghanistan or not? Time Magazine has shocked its readers with its latest cover photograph. A picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case, we don't know what thousand words we're talking about. It was an unusually graphic image for an American news magazine, and Time's editor, Richard Stengel, knew it. I really agonized about whether to put it on the cover or not because it's disturbing. It's disturbing on all kinds of levels. Did Time use Bibi Aisha's image to try to win the hearts and minds of the American public, a public that has grown weary of the war in Afghanistan? It's all very reminiscent of 1985, when another foreign force from the Soviet Union was mired in a war in Afghanistan, and another American magazine put a provocative image of a female face on its cover. You could see in the eyes of that beautiful little girl all the horror, all the sadness of one person. Uh, that's something that no article could have conveyed as powerfully as that picture. At the time of the National Geographic article, the international community was washing its hands of Afghanistan. Today, the international community has hundreds of thousands of uh, troops on the ground, but the question remains for the people of the world. Will they look at that photo and will they feel a sense of shared humanity with the people of Afghanistan. Richard Stengel made the rounds on the talk show circuit, attempting to explain some of the thinking behind the cover image and its bold headline. It's interesting. There's no question mark. What happens if we leave Afghanistan? Was that intentional? Well, I, I never, I, I mean, uh, I'm, you know, I, I think question, I think we answer questions. I don't think we ask them. However, and the implied logic behind Time's cover does not stand up. The woman was disfigured in 2009. The presence of U.S. forces in Afghanistan did not protect her. Beginning with the headline, the premise of the Time Magazine story is inherently flawed. If atrocities are happening now, after nine years of U.S. occupation, during U.S. occupation, and women are being abused now, please explain what the difference is going to be after the U.S. withdraws. The magazine laid out the actual timeline in the article itself, but that did not square with the unmistakable message the cover conveyed. Another serious journalistic issue was raised by the New York publication The Observer. Its media watch team revealed the story's author, Erin Baker, had a potential conflict of interest in Afghanistan that she did not reveal. What Erin Baker failed to let us in on was two things. Um, first, her husband sits on the board of a $100 million drive for private investment in Afghanistan. Second, the husband has this computer services and IT company that's made a lot of money with help from the IT contracting system. When these huge undisclosed profits enter the picture, 
it becomes this matter of, of public trust being violated. In journalism, every conflict of interest must be revealed. If your wife or your husband is working for a group that could benefit from an article that you're writing, the reader deserves to know, period. Time issued a statement rejecting the notion that Baker or her husband had any financial stake in a continued U.S. presence in Afghanistan and called her story a straightforward piece of reporting. But that's not the way Stengel characterized the article before the conflict of interest arose, back when he was making the media rounds. I really wanted us to weigh in in a powerful way with one particular point of view. A particular point of view that then gets endorsed and amplified through other news organizations. Yeah, well, no, that's well, I think this is a very brave cover, Rick. We wanted to contribute to the debate and the conversation, and this is obviously a really important aspect of it. And certainly um, timely with all the documents that were leaked on, on WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks's release of the Afghan war logs with its documentation of the myriad difficulties facing coalition forces had been dominating headlines and framing the debate in America on Afghanistan. Time's cover story and the accompanying interviews attempted to and may have succeeded in giving Americans a new and emotive angle to consider, women's rights. I don't think any press is good press, as they say, when it comes to women's rights in Afghanistan. If you look at Time magazine's cover, see the mutilated woman's face, and then read the statement next to it, what happens if we leave Afghanistan, you come away from that with a very unhelpful and distorted understanding of what heavy U.S. troop presences mean for women's rights in Afghanistan. U.S. policy in Afghanistan with regards to this war has empowered some of the most radically anti-woman reactionary people within the Kabul government itself, while at the same time the heavy troop presence is legitimizing the Taliban insurgency among the rural Pashtuns that Time magazine seems to be so worried about. The article itself inside the magazine doesn't actually make a case that there is a connection between saving women like Bibi Aisha and ISAF staying in Afghanistan. That said, there's a sort of soft reaction to a, an American in the supermarket walking down the aisle and their eye being caught by this, uh, that they may say, oh, okay, that's why we're in Afghanistan. Time magazine can be found on newsstands around the world, but there's no confusion about its country of origin, its point of view. That we are supporting the war. And it's not the first time the editor of the magazine has sounded more like an American politician than a journalist. Have a look at this fantastic cover, which is about to come on, How Not to Lose in Afghanistan. That is it's a great a, photograph, too. It, this was Stengel last year, promoting another article that coincided with the announcement of the U.S. escalation in Afghanistan. Like, famously, George Washington won by not losing. That's the only way that we can have a real victory in Afghanistan, is by not losing, by not letting the country get overrun and taken over. It's very hard now to win hearts and minds like our original policy was. Winning hearts and minds, that's something that politicians and their generals like to talk about. And it's something that some news outlets try to do when America goes to war and has to decide if that war is still worth fighting. Our Global Village Voice is now on Time Magazine, the media, and Afghanistan. I'm actually more concerned about how the article has been influenced by stereotypes of what Afghan women as passive victims or Western soldiers as benevolent heroes than I am about the reporter's own connection to the issue. I'm not sure the story would have been told all that differently either way. The issue here is with the cover. And if we look at the text, uh, what happens if we leave Afghanistan? Uh, although one tends to read that with a question mark there, there is none. So what it's doing is saying, it's making a, a threat, it's issuing a warning, it's saying, if we leave Afghanistan, this is the fate of the, the women of this country. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Go to WikiLeaks's Twitter page, and among the messages you will find there is this. We were warned to expect dirty tricks. Now we have the first one. The whistleblowing site was referring to a 24-hour period in which the site's co-founder and chief spokesman, Julian Assange, was charged with rape. The arrest warrant was put out by a Swedish court. Within a day of the warrant being issued, the charge was dropped due to a lack of evidence. Assange said in a telephone interview with Al Jazeera that it was obvious that this is some sort of smear 
smear campaign, but he stopped short of saying who was responsible. A lot of people have feared for Assange long before the site released more than 75,000 confidential U.S. military documents about the war in Afghanistan. Many of the site's supporters have predicted that the Pentagon and various governments with secrets to keep simply will not tolerate the existence of the open source site where anyone can post leaked information and just about anyone can read it. Anyone, that is, who's not in Thailand. The authorities there have used a five-year-old law to temporarily, they say, block access to the site. That order came from a government unit that was set up to deal with issues emanating from the political unrest that started in March and lasted for two months. It's not clear if there are any documents in particular that the Thai government did not want its citizens seeing, but this kind of thing is not new to the country. Tens of thousands of web pages, including YouTube, have been blocked in Thailand over the past few years, the bulk of them for being critical of the royal family, which is a crime in Thailand. As usual, WikiLeaks is not taking this lying down. It used its Twitter page to announce the launching of TyLeaks, a new web page providing what WikiLeaks calls magnet links that will allow Thais to see the blocked content and, as WikiLeaks puts it, keep information flowing. There is a ban of another kind in Venezuela, a country that has had a long-running media war. Newspapers there have been prohibited from publishing pictures of crime and violence for the next month. A government tribunal issued the ban after one of the leading daily newspapers ran a graphic photo of 12 naked corpses, reportedly murder victims, on its front page. The official reason given for the ban is that children and adolescents need to be protected from such disturbing photos. Opponents of President Hugo Chavez call it a transparent effort by the government to censor the press so that they can't report on escalating violent crime there ahead of next month's parliamentary elections. That argument has been countered by Chavez supporters who say that opposition newspapers, which are privately owned and politically aligned with the opposition, are playing up the violence to make the president look bad. After the break, it's back to Afghanistan with a piece on the pros and the cons, well, cons mostly, of embedded journalism. Welcome back. We're reaching into our archives again this week for part two of our look at Afghanistan. Earlier this year, Operation Mushtarak took place. It was the biggest military offensive from the coalition side since the war began in 2001. And one of the reasons you probably heard about it is that the combat push was accompanied by a media surge, an escalation of coverage. A vital element of the coalition's media strategy is the embed program. Embedding journalists within military units became standard operating procedure during the early stages of the Afghan and Iraq conflicts, and now more and more of the coverage that you're seeing from war zones comes from embedded reporters. But there are problems inherent with this kind of arrangement. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on embedded journalism, the advantages, the pitfalls, and the journalists who take issue with it. Tonight, Nick Schifrin travels with the top U.S. commander in Afghanistan to one of the most remote... In November last year, the average was 69. The military believe around 400 to 1,000... Three months later, in February this year, the number had jumped to 84. This will be the seventh spring offensive since this long... Sometime Halfway through May, and the average number of journalists embedded with international forces in Afghanistan is 73. More and more, the story of the war in Afghanistan is being told by journalists on the road with military units. Now, Aratia Albawi and photographer Mary Rogers have been embedded with U.S. Marines in the... Most journalists who cover the conflict uh, in Afghanistan cover it embedded with coalition NATO military troops. The military want to win the war. Um, there's no question about it. Um, the media and information and propaganda are all part of the conflict. The entire valley. And in this conflict, reporting from the battlefield means you have to be embedded. And U.S. troops have captured this spot, giving them... For the militaries involved, embeds provide a large measure of control over the media message. NBC's Richard Engel is embedded with U.S. troops in Afghanistan's Kunar province. For reporters and news organizations, trading some of their editorial independence means they get two things in return security and pictures. The embed program is at heart a good thing. It gives an opportunity for journalists to go to this very, in many ways, confusing, scattered war. How bad is this area? And, and cover it close up. The pictures from embeds are inclined to be 
sort of like nothing we've managed as journalists, as video journalists, to get for, for, for decades. For as many cop houses as possible. So in a sense, they've got an incredible pull to broadcasters because you do get amazing pictures of fighting and war. But what the pictures don't show is the other side of the war. The vast majority of the footage is of guns being fired. What embeds don't provide is images of where the bombs and bullets land. As a journalist who's been embedded multiple times, uh, but also lived in Afghanistan just uh, as a journalist, the perspectives are very, very different. When you're embedded, you're basically in this bubble. The thing that's really missing is the Afghan perspective. The core problem with embedded journalism in Afghanistan, and anywhere for that matter, is that the journalists naturally identify with who you're with. Uh, come on in, Chaplain Bruley. Uh, this is Talk about Chaplain not having objectivity or uh, not having the, uh, separation. Battalion, Being with men and women whose lives are at stake forges an identity where you and they are one here. and the same. And what we need our journalists to do is the opposite of embed, is to be one step removed so they can ask the hard questions. For reporters who buck the control of the military, the implications are often serious. There is a problem with the embed program, and, and that has to do with the way that the military shapes coverage. If the military doesn't like the story, doesn't like the images that you took, uh, doesn't like the way you phrased certain things or the quotes that you selected from soldiers, they can terminate your embed immediately. The termination is irrevocable and unappealable. In the last 36 hours alone, the reason that I embed much less now is because um, I've been blacklisted. Uh, quite simply, there was one episode uh, in Helmand where I ended up having an argument with my minder, with my sensor, over whether or not I could show a video clip which showed a British soldier shooting a machine gun without his body armor. Now, this had nothing to do with operational security. It was purely to do with domestic British political concerns because there was a big debate raging over soldiers' welfare. And I was told that if I didn't remove that clip, if I didn't swap it for something else, then I would never get another embed in Helmand. For the military, the stakes are too high to risk unfavorable news reports from embedded correspondents. Up until last year, the US military hired a communications consulting firm called the Rendon Group to vet journalists before they would allow them to be embedded. PJ Tobaya actually saw the report the Rendon Group wrote about him. My Rendon report was sort of like perusing the diary of my stalker. They had found pretty much everything I've written for the last five years or so, including personal interviews like this one I'm doing right now with you. It was a little creepy, I guess, and then they then rate the journalists. In August of 2009, Tobiah published his Rendon report on his blog. Shortly thereafter, the company lost its contract with the US military. Those who take issue with the embed program aren't opposed only to the monitoring and control of correspondence. News organizations come under fire as well for allowing so much of their coverage to come from embeds. Because as an April report by Jerome Starkey in the Times of London showed, the unembedded perspective is a vital counterpoint to the military approved message. For the first time, U.S. and NATO officials admit that a February raid by U.S. Special Operations troops in Afghanistan went very, very wrong. There was a night raid in this place called Khattaba in eastern Afghanistan, and NATO issued a statement saying that their force found the bodies of three women tied up, gagged, and killed. And now for the really horrible twist. The Times of London is reporting that not only did U.S. Special Operations Forces kill these women, but they may have also tried to cover up that fact. The family claim that the U.S. forces dug the bullets out of the dead bodies of the victims. The U.S. forces insist there is no evidence to corroborate any claims of a cover-up. The report that Jerome Starkey ran uh, in the Times of London about the NATO cover-up never would have happened. Uh, that story never would have happened from an embedded reporter. For one very important reason, the soldiers who carried out that night raid were special forces operators. One of the hard and fast rules of embedding, in fact it's in a contract that you sign before you're embedded, um, is that you will not take pictures of special forces personnel. So that story never would have been found by an embedded reporter because an embedded reporter never would have been embedded with a special forces unit. And now that the operation has started, it's taken... And with stories like the one he broke about the NATO cover-up, Jerome Starkey is unlikely to get an embed anytime soon. Because when it comes to the military managing the message, it's not just about who they take with them, but who they leave behind. The pictures that don't get shot, 
the stories that go untold. More Global Village Voices now on journalists embedding into military units. Embedded reporting is a viable option in war zones when independent reporting is impossible or too dangerous. But the intrinsic objectivity of a journalist is compromised. We need to have, especially in Afghanistan, reporters on the ground and being able to give us a sense of what Afghans themselves are thinking. Embedding or the buddy system for journalists creates a feeling of kinship between reporters and soldiers. But most important, no reporter wants to be around a bunch of guys with guns after he or she has filed a bad report. Finally, it's editorial disclosure time. We were going to wait until our September 11th program to look at the controversy over the establishment of the Islamic Community Center not far from the site of the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan. However, the media side of that story is clearly out of control, so we'll look at it next week. What will our take be on that? Probably something along the lines of Mark Fiore's. He's an American online cartoonist, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and his animated characters seem to make a good deal more sense of the situation than the talking heads of the media are. So we've made his latest creation our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. Dog boy, come here, quick! President accounted for, Mr. Dan. What is it? The Muslims, dog boy. Did you hear what they're up to now? Sure, Mr. Dan. Celebrating Ramadan with fasting, charity, sharing, and other good No! They're trying to build a mosque at Ground Zero. You mean the community center and prayer room two and a half blocks away? Yes, but that counts as at Ground Zero. But doesn't America have religious freedom everywhere? Yes, and that's what makes this country great. But this is different. How's that, Mr. Dan? Muslims attacked us on September 11th. All Muslims? Whoa, that must have been a big plane. Dog boy! If we let them build their mosque there, it'd be like... Like Muslims praying in the Pentagon? What the? I didn't know about that. No! It'd be like... Like, like letting Japanese fly planes over Pearl Harbor? Yes! Uh, no! It'd be like a slap in the face to those who died and suffered on September 11th. But wouldn't it be good to have peaceful Muslims right there? You just don't get it, dog boy. Anywhere but there. Anywhere. Anywhere? Yes, anywhere. Mr. Dan, but what about... No buts. Anywhere Mr. else. Mr. Dan, look out! Anywhere but here.